back to Open Line. We are talking history, and we are talking with Dr. Lee Williams, Jr., TSU professor. He's a professor of African American and public history at TSU and also coordinator of the North Nashville Heritage Project. Um, Want to go to the phones here, so let's go to George. Hello, George. George, are you there? Yes. Go right ahead. What's on I your agree. mind? All right. So uh, I was listening to this conversation. I was wondering how the how come the bad doesn't outweigh the good, or the good doesn't outweigh the bad. What do you mean? What do I mean? Uh, so. Uh, in the preservation of national history. You think, okay, all right. How does the good outweigh the bad? Um, what, do, what do you think he's saying there? I, um, oftentimes with our memories, um, we elevate the good and suppress the bad stuff that happens to us. Um, if something good happens to us, or we do something that we think is worthwhile, um, we tell everybody about it. But if it's something negative, if it's something that reflects poorly on us, then we don't, um, we don't put that out there. As a matter of fact, you have people that earn money by extracting, getting us to talk about our bad memories. Mm -hmm. um, I think with public memory, you're dealing with the same sort of thing with with Nashville, and 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 this is true of the South too. I think um, the South has a legacy of slavery. That is, slavery persists here after many northern areas abolish it, um, and there's no hiding what it took to keep these folks enslaved. People were enslaved because of violence. I think it was James Baldwin who said that slavery was largely kept because of the, what did he say, the pistol and the whip, the gun and the whip. Um, but in order to do this, you had to dehumanize the people. You had to make them brutes. But that's tough to reconcile with the fact that, you know, intuitively you knew that these were human beings and we knew that these they, they knew that these folks were human beings because they from time to time they would have relations with them and have babies and so forth but to to speak to the caller's question as to why we amplify the good and and suppress the bad um i, I think it's just a part of memory whether it's individual or public or collective memory and have we done that you feel like we have done that in Nashville. Uh, we without, have suppressed the bad. Without a, a doubt. And um, so is it healthy to then bring that back up? Is it important? I think in many ways before you can move forward, um, you have to come to grips with all of your history. Um, it's, for me, if you, um, you know, if, if there's something on your conscience and you know you and it's weighing down your conscience, you can still be functional. You can still get out and do what you have to do. Um, but you move a little bit better once you release whatever that negative energy is that's holding you down. I want to put up another one of your um, newspaper clippings, and mm -hmm. this is from uh, the Public Square, and the Public Square. Um, is an important place today in Nashville and was always an important place. What are we looking at here? This is talking about a company that's selling insurance on slaves. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and and you notice where it talks about farmhands, steamboat, firemen, and cabin boys and so forth. Um, enslaved black men and women were treated as property. And sometimes we know even today property can be damaged and property can be lost. What this insurance company did was it protected enslavers against the loss of property. This company was there located on the public square mm -hmm. opposite Planters Bank. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that's amazing. 
that which is is interesting too. Just and I think when I looked at that, I was struck by the proximity of all of these places to each other. Because you got the insurance company, you got Planners Bank, and and the courthouse is sitting right there. So um, if if you needed money, the bank could very well loan you money for land and for enslaved men and women, and usually at um, pretty reasonable rates. You take that money, you go to the courthouse and make a bid, and then you could end up um, with a man or a woman or a child or whatever enslaved. I believe the next um, article we'll put up there, or clipping, is an actual sale. They're talking about the sale. Three Negroes for sale. I have for sale a Negro woman about 35 years of age, a good cook and washer. Also two very likely girl children, eight and nine years of age. I would prefer selling them to some person living in Nashville or Davidson County. Mm -hmm. And again, public square, 64 public square. Mm -hmm. um, where, where, did, where did you find that and, and what, do you, what do you think when you, when you see that? I, I can't remember the ad off the top of my head, but um, I, um, usually you can find these ads in the classified ads. Um, and you, um, the same places, like right before that, you might see the sale of a horse or the sale of other property. But I think what's striking about that is um, you notice that he's, he's selling women. Um, if a slave owner bought a woman, he was not potentially just buying one slave. And if you follow me, he's thinking about, particularly with these young girls, um, their likelihood of, of having children. And we're mindful that the status of a child followed that of his mother during this time. So if any of these enslaved girls have kids, they're going to be slaves. So that's increasing his profit. And even if you start considering um, his ownership of them and, and the children that they produce, that's going to extend from um, from cradle to grave. And you could probably make the argument that even after they died, because oftentimes masters could um, could sell the cadavers, the bodies, to um, medical schools, to people that need bodies for, um, for medical, their medical studies and so forth. It said two very likely young girls. What, what does that mean? Healthy, good looking, um, having the potential to bear children. He's saying that I got some pretty good looking young girls here. But within that, I, um, and this is the thing that, that, that strikes me. Um, in grad school, I was admonished to start looking at a lot of the stuff that I studied through the eyes of women. And this kind of affected how I look at the public square. Um, those that 35 year old woman and those three girls would be subjected to everything that we associated with slavery but there's the opportunity for um, sexual assault um, rape and violence of that nature and it would be even more so back then because there weren't any restraints placed upon slave masters they have absolute control over these women so I, um, and I have to thank my professor for this, because once I started doing that, um, a, a new dimension of African American history opened up to me. And those two clippings show again the public square was kind of the, it was the center of Nashville and the center of, of this activity. And so how, how does that impact you today even? And how should it impact any of us today, but w when, when we are there, if at all? It, um, well, I don't feel that we should erase these people from public memory because their lives mattered. I, um, when I'm there, 
and, and this is because I've read so much and become very sensitive to it. I um, I go to the public square and I'll have a good time, like I'll catch a concert or something, and I'm I'm usually there and I'm having a good time. But inevitably, um, my mind will focus on what took place there. Typically on Saturday afternoons, around two o'clock ish, and um, I, I can't imagine a woman being placed for sale on on the courthouse steps. Maybe she has a baby in her arms and she has somebody ironing her up and down and although she can't say anything she's uttering a silent prayer that this guy will purchase her and her baby. Oftentimes think about how sometimes um, a woman would find herself thinking that she's pregnant and then regret that knowing what she was bringing and bringing this baby into the world to confront. Um, I read, and I don't know if I have this posted or not, but I read um, about a family who made a pact um, that they were going to commit suicide. It was the husband, the wife, and they had two babies. So the woman goes to the river and she waits, but her husband doesn't show up, and I'm not sure whether or not he was on a plantation, on a different plantation. So what she does is she put a baby in each arm, and she jumps into the river, and all three drown. And I read that, and I was struck, because I thought about what she must have faced that, that led her to the conclusion that jumping in this river with the two children that she loved, and there's no more powerful love, I think, than a mother having for her child, right? Uh, but she jumped into the river and, and, and killed them all. Um, wow. So for me, the, the public square more than anything, I think, is, um, you know, it's it's a textbook of Nashville's early history, but it's one that's incomplete. And and with any textbook, you know, once we learn more information, once we get different interpretations of that, it needs to come out with a new edition. And maybe that's what we're trying to do. At, with it's healthy Nashville. to see all of it. Yeah. Um, and all right, we have to go to break. Where, where did you find these? Are these these newspaper clippings? Are they? Uh, um, Nashville, Tennessean, um, the Republican, uh, uh, let's say this, any Nashville newspaper that was in existence from the early settlement to the end of the Civil War, you will find them in the classified ads. Those there's, things there's, are they're there. Yes. All right, we're going to take a break. Then I promise we're going to take calls. Reverend Fuzz is on the line, Ivy, Vivian. There are a bunch of people on the line. So we're going to okay. take a break. Come back. Take your calls right after this.